Now today we are going to be doing a recreation of the first ever uh, draw along anatomy tutorial I ever created a few years ago as a medical student, which is going to be bones of the hand and wrist. So the way that we are going to approach this is by working proximally to distally. If you remember proximal meaning closer to the center of the body and distal meaning further away. So we're actually going to start with the forearm. So the structure of the arm is relatively simple. We have the humerus, the big arm bone here where our biceps attach to and our triceps at the back. Then this comes down obviously into our elbow joint where we have the radius which sits on this side closer to our thumb and the ulna which runs up this side. We actually call these the radial and the ulna aspects of the arm because of the bones on each side. An easy way to remember which is which is you think when you feel for your pulse, you're feeling for your radial pulse or the pulsating radial artery. And it's called that because it's on the radial side. So we're going to draw our radius coming in at the bottom here with its flat sort of articulating surface. And then next to it, we have the ulna and its little styloid process sticking up. Now I know it looks odd doing them at the bottom of the screen like this, but we're going to need the room in a minute. So we can go ahead and label these. We've got our radius and ulna. Now just to get our perspective clear, before we move on, what we're about to draw is a right hand looking from the top down, what we call a pronated position. So this is my right hand. We are drawing as if we were looking down at the top. It probably is good practice here to draw on our anatomical sort of axes if you like so on the right side of the image we have the medial side of the hand and on the left side of our image here we have the lateral side remember that medial in anatomy is talking about closer to the midline and lateral talking away from the midline and it's confusing with hands because if we've got our hand in this position obviously it looks like my thumb is coming into the midline and my little finger going away. However, we have to remember that in anatomical terms, we need to think about the anatomical position. If you think about da Vinci's Vitruvian man in this sort of position, so you can still see my hands on the screen, the thumbs face outwards and therefore the thumbs are considered the lateral part of the hand and the little finger, the medial part. So let's start with our wrist bones. The first one that we're going to draw in down here is scaphoid. So this is the most proximal and the most lateral of the carpal or wrist bones. Very old texts refer to it as the navicular bone of the hand. The navicular bone is a similar bone in the foot named navicular because it looks like a sailing boat. I don't see it myself, but scaphoid is the equivalent in the hand, sometimes known as the hand navicular. And the bone that sits immediately next to it, like this, is called the lunate bone. As you might imagine, named for its lunate or moon-like shape when it was discovered, it was described as looking like the crescent moon. Now sitting next to the lunate bone here, the second to last of our home row or proximal row is a bone called triquetrum, which again, Latin means three cornered. But the reason why I've left it incomplete here is that over the top, of triquetrum sits the last bone called pisiform, which means P-shaped. So we'll just be careful with our lettering in here. There's pisiform, can I fit triquetrum in here just? So that's the proximal row, the first four of the carpal bones. We now need to complete the next four for the distal row. Now articulating with scaphoid in the most lateral aspect is a bone called trapezium. So let's label it up. Now trapezium is not Latin, it's ancient Greek and it comes from trapezion which if I recall correctly means little table. And then filling in this space here is a similar bone called trapezoid which comes from the same root but is a smaller bone than trapezium. Now these two together are sometimes called the multangular bones. Trapezium is the greater multangular bone because it's much bigger. Trapezoid is the lesser multangular bone. Now the third bone in the distal row 
is called the capitate. Capitate. Moving back to Latin again from caput to meaning head, as in to decapitate, to remove someone's head. And then the last one that we're going to add in to complete the distal row is called the hamate from hamulus, which means a little hook. And we'll add a little hook. The hamate has this little hook-shaped process on the bone, which is classically injured during the swing of a golf stroke. It's called a golfer's fracture, when this little hook-shaped process gets fractured off. If someone hits the ground abruptly with their golf club, it can sometimes fracture off this little process of bone. And all of these together, we refer to as the carpal bones or the wrist bones. Now we are very quickly just going to backtrack and look in here and you'll see that there's a big gap that exists between the ulna and the wrist bones. Is that just empty space? Well, no. In reality, we're just going to add it in. There are lots of ligaments and little bits of fibrous tissue that run in this space that actually takes the form of what we call an articular disc, which, as its name suggests, is a disc that allows the ulna to articulate with the carpal bones, just as the radius articulates directly with the scaphoid. Because as I'm sure you can imagine, we have an incredible degree of movement in our wrist, so we need all of these joints to articulate very smoothly. And we're actually gonna get rid of our title as well, because we're not gonna have space for it. So now let's start adding some digits to our hand, because it wouldn't be a hand without fingers and thumbs. And this next set of bones that we're going to add is called the metacarpals or the knuckle bones. We have four of these plus one at the base of the thumb. And I am taking some artistic license here, guys, because everything is not this kind of perfect in reality. But the point of this video is more clinical to illustrate the bones that exist rather than perfectly how they articulate with one another. So these, so these are our metacarpal or knuckle bones, and we can label them one to five, where number one is in the thumb, two in the forefinger, three in the middle finger, and so on. So once again, we can label these as the metacarpals. So here's where we're at currently. We've come up with the radius and ulna into the carpal bones at the base of the hand and the wrist, we're now up to the knuckles. So we need to actually add our fingers, or in anatomical terms, what we call phalanges. As I'm sure you can tell by actually looking at one of your fingers, it's made up of three smaller bones. One, two, three. So we're going to start with the forefinger here. One, two, and then the final bone. Almost, I think it looks like a pawn from, from a game of chess or maybe like a bishop's hat, whatever works for you. We'll fill in these for each of the fingers. So this first of the three bones, the one that sits closest to the knuckles, closest to the metacarpals, we call the proximal phalanx. Phalanx being singular for phalanges. So we're in the ring finger here, the middle bone, we call the middle phalanx, um, perhaps unsurprisingly. And then finally, we're on to our little finger, which will have littler phalanges. And the outer one here we call the distal phalanx because it's the furthest away. So let's label these up. So we have the proximal phalanges. In the middle, we have the middle phalanges or singular phalanx if you're talking about one of them. And then up here, furthest away, we have the distal phalanges. You can obviously find these on yourself, proximal, middle, distal, and you can see that they separate when we flex the finger. Probably easier to see if I do it from that angle for the camera. So why have I not done it for the thumb yet? That's a very good question. You tell me, what's different if you look at your thumb compared to one of your fingers? Well, the answer is in the number of bones. If you flex it, unlike with one of our fingers, where there are three separate bones that make it up in the thumb, there are only two bones. There's one here, close to the knuckle, but when I bend it, there's only one more bone. So when I add these bones in, I'm gonna keep them nice and small because the thumb is nice and small. 
There is no middle phalanx, there is only a proximal and a distal. So we're nearly there now guys, we've just got some features and articulations that we need to label for complete understanding. Because if we're trying to describe injuries or the locations of things, it's useful to be able to describe them in anatomical terms. So this here, where the radius meets the proximal row of the carpal bones, we call the radio carpal joint. Anatomy is so easy. Things are just named for what they are. It's where the radius meets the carpal bones. Nice and easy. Similar on this side. This site here, which is formed by the articular disc, I'm sure you will have been able to guess, is the ulno carpal joint. Where the ulna bone on the ulna aspect of the arm meets the carpal bones. Simple. And then when it comes to moving into the digits and the phalanges, again, we simply name the joint that is taking place. All along here, for example, what do we have? We have the carpal bones on the proximal side meeting the metacarpal bones, the knuckle bones, on the distal side. So I'm actually going to draw a label out here and using exactly the same uh, naming paradigm that we've been using so far, we call this the carpo metacarpal so we've got the carpal bones meeting the metacarpal bones joints. Now I've kind of drawn a continuous line here, but what this is referring to is the individual articulations between the carpal bones and the metacarpal bones in each joint. So there are five independent joints of which you can imagine the thumb is the most flexible because it has the most degrees of freedom or essentially directions in which it can move. It's the most flexible of the carpometacarpal joints. We're getting there, I promise you. So how about this one? We have the metacarpal bones in the most proximal aspect meeting the phalanges. So just as before, we call these the metacarpo phalangeal joints or the MCP joint for short. Then moving up, we have two more joints in the phalanges, one here and one here. And the naming that we're going to use is just as simple. You can abbreviate if you like, just for the purposes of this video, I'll write it in full. But this first one here is the proximal interphalangeal joint. This makes sense, right? It's within the phalanx. This makes sense, right? It's within the phalanx, so it's an interphalangeal joint and it's the most proximal one. And as I'm sure you can imagine, the more distal one is called the distal interphalangeal joint. And in practice, as you will imagine, these are often shortened to pips and dips. Now, the last thing to consider before we move on to a memory device is the numbering of the digits. And these are what we call our thumb and fingers. They're all digits for the purposes of anatomy. The thumb being digit number one, and then two, three, four, with our little finger being digit number five. And lastly, the thumb, just as our big, and lastly, the thumb has its own special name in anatomy, which is pollux. You often see both pollux and pollux written. I don't know why this comes about. Someone who knows more about Latin and ancient Greek will have to enlighten me and tell us all in the comments. Now to close out with a quick memory device, this is one of those rude medical mnemonics that everyone has heard passed down and everyone remembers. I'm sure that's how these things become embedded because they just become a meme that permeates through medical education. And the way that I remember the order of the wrist bones from lateral to medial, proximal to distal is some lovers try positions that they can't handle. So that's scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and the hamate. Now it's time for a quick quiz and we'll see how much you've taken in. So there you have it guys, the bones of the hand and wrist. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for watching. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe. Don't forget to go and check out my website for more videos just like this and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.